to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know what saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my mind was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now the hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Which is eternal and blessing supernal from his precious and I receive heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole my sin
know if I'm doing that right or not. <laughs> All right, let's do the last verse. He will keep me till the river rolls. He will keep me. Oh. It goes back three, four. Four, that's, y'all picked a hard one. Sorry, this is what you get when you got somebody leading music that don't read music. story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. All right, thank you for singing. Y'all can put up your hymnals and Brother Jeremy if you'll come down. That's okay, I do read music. And it wasn't all the way right, but it was close enough that y'all made it through it. It's the words that matter, matter, that's right. Uh, I mean, if you can sing Amazing Grace to the same tune of the House of the Rising Sun, I guess it doesn't matter what music you put with it as long as the words are right. So, uh, now if you have your Bible, now see, I don't have that luxury in the Word of God. Y'all know that, right? You can't take artistic liberty with the Word of God. You've got to rightly divide it. And so we're going to try that tonight. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Now here's something I love, and, and this is, um, I guess, on the forefront of my mind. Time is very, very valuable. Do you know that? And if there's anything that Paul was, I guess, trying to get across in these last few uh, verses to the church at Colossae and to those who were following him as uh, he was trying to get them to redeem their time, to make sure that they're using it in the appropriate manner. Why? Because Paul was imprisoned in Rome. We, we know that from the history of, of how uh, we have his travels and the things. And could you imagine him being uh, in Rome And yes, there was times he was under that praetorian guard, but could you imagine the deep recesses of the dungeons in Rome? I mean, rats, sewage, the the corpses that were decaying, I mean, just being bound, hands and feet, being in, in, in shackles and in chains. And then all of a sudden, out of all of that, when he had the chance to finally get to write back to people, He writes to him these words, and listen to what he says. Chapter 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer. And watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open up unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. And walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. There is no doubt that Paul, in the latter part of his life there in Rome, ready to give his life for Christ, was still trying to encourage Christians. So I, I want to try to encourage you the best as I can tonight from the text and what it says to us to where we'll be encouraged to keep pressing on. Why? Because if there's ever a time we need to redeem the time that God has, it's now. How many of you looked up at the sky the other day during the eclipse? Did you see it? Some did because I saw you on Facebook. You were traveling and, and some went and got into that path of totality or near it and things. But I'm going to tell you, it was cloudy here. It got a little bit darker, but it really wasn't anything to think about. I just thought it was going to rain more. But do you know what's kind of amazing? All the people in the world that were all bent upon 
oh, is Jesus coming back? Is this apocalyptic? Is this this? Is this that? And this all that. And, and they missed one of the greatest things they ever could, and that is this God is still true to his word. And if there's ever a time that we need to put truth out there, it's now. Why? Because we need to redeem the time that we have. How do we do that? First of all, if we're going to redeem our time that we have, that God has given us, we got to understand our privilege in prayer. He says, in all of this, continue praying. Continue praying. Any of you had a hard week already? I've already dealt with some things that I just, I just had to turn over to the Lord and say, Lord, here. I don't know what to do, don't know what to say, but here it is. Uh, give me wisdom. Help me through this. Who do you call in your time of emergency? I would like to think that if you were having a medical emergency, that if you dial 911, you get that 911 dispatcher, and they're going to dispatch what you need to get you the help that you need. What, what happens when uh, you go and, and you're in a, a situation to where maybe your tire explodes? Who do you call? Well, if you, you're a lady, you, hopefully you're calling your husband and saying, Hey, my tire just exploded. I need you to fix Or you can do like it says on the sign. Just call Watha. He'll tow you anywhere. You better, get your, you better get your checkbook out. See, I can talk about him. He married my wife's daddy's first cousin. Y'all didn't know that, did you? He ain't no relation to me, so I don't know. I guess I can still talk about him. But anyways, he and I carry on several conversations. Why? Because I usually am the one he's towing. But who, who do you reach out to in an emergency? Now, I would like to say that I am a person of prominence, that if I needed somebody important, I could probably call him. And then I got to thinking about it. You know, if I called Joe Biden, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even answer the phone. Can anybody get in touch with Joe Biden? No, I, I know there's some jokes going around. Well, could you get in touch with Kamala Harris? I don't know why you'd want to, but still. Would you call the governor? Can you get in touch with Kay Ivey? If I want to talk to the mayor, I just walk across the street. If I want to talk to the councilman, I go right back there. He's right back there. I'm trying to get him to run for mayor later on. And y'all just write his name in and we're all good. Helping a brother out. And he said, preacher, I don't need enemies like that. But anyway. Who's the most important person that you could call in an emergency? Who, who would be able to respond to you at any given time? Is there somebody that you could count on day or night that you could just trust? Hey, here it is. Can I tell you? I might not be able to reach the president, the congressman, mayor, councilman, all the. I may not be able to reach them. But when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, I had instant access to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Isn't that good to know? He's never failed me in a time of emergency. He's never failed me when I've called out upon him and needing a help or needing a peace or needing a power to go. And, and Paul is saying, look, here I am in the midst of all my circumstances, and I want to encourage you to remember you've got the greatest privilege of all, and that is no matter how bad circumstances get, no matter how secular the world is, and no matter what it, they think is the apocalypse and all this, we have the privilege to where we can pray. And he says, don't give up. Keep praying. Don't stop. Continue praying. Why? Look, there's been so many times I've had husbands and wives come and say, we just can't stand each other anymore. Well, when's the last time you prayed? There's been relationships that have been hurt. There's been jobs that have been lost. There's been all kinds of things that are going on. And, and I always ask the people, I say, well, how are you praying? How can I pray for you? Why? Because that's the greatest resource that we have in those times. We have to continue praying. Don't give up. Continue it. You say, well, you don't know the circumstances. Well, you look at Paul's life. He was in some pretty bad circumstances. He was going to face death, and the only thing that he had done was preach Christ. And he says, no matter what the circumstances, keep praying. And then he goes a little bit further, and he says, and watch in the same way with thanksgiving. In that privilege of prayer, do you know it means when he says that word watch, it literally means to be on alert. He says, prayer will be a time when you're under the most attack. Have you ever, and we had a, a group that sent me a text, and I watched this little clip that they put in there, and it was about prayer. And, and they said, have you ever noticed 
when you come into worship, you're not really distracted when you're singing. Uh, some of you are not even distracted when Brother Jeremy's up here preaching or when babies start crying and all this stuff. I just keep on going. If the lights go out, don't worry, I'm going to keep preaching. But have you ever noticed when you stop to pray, it's like all of hell itself is against you. If there's a time your cell phone's going to ring, it's going to be when you're praying. If there's a time when somebody might walk in on it, it's going to be when you're praying. If there's times when all these thoughts and all these things will start coming to your mind, it's usually when you're praying. Why? Because when you start accessing the throne of grace, the devil himself has to shudder. And when you shudder the devil, I guarantee you he's going to send all of his armies, everything that he can to throw at you to try to distract you. Which means what? There's going to be all kinds of things that are out there that will try to distract have you ever been praying and then all of a sudden your mind just gets sidetracked? Now I'm going to go ahead and help you with some theology here, okay? The devil cannot read your mind. But he can hear what you're praying. That's why the Bible says that there's sometimes that we can't even make utterance. Why? Because we're so crushed and what does the Holy Spirit of God do? He makes utterance before us, for us and before the throne of grace. But what happens when we start speaking out the name of Jesus? I tell you what happens. Everybody and their brother that is against the name of Jesus comes after you. And just as I believe that there's angels that are all around us ministering to the saints of God, I know that there is a spiritual battle going on even with demons and principalities and powers all around us. And so I promise you this, when you start praying and you start praying the name of Jesus, hell itself will be there to try to distract you. The devil will throw things at you to try to distract you. And then he'll even do this. He'll come up and he'll try to belittle you in your process of the way that you're engaging God and saying, well, who are you to talk to God? I know what you did last time. I know where you've been. And the Bible even says that Satan makes accusation before God against us how do i know that he's the accuser of the brethren and what does the accuser do brings charges against you but here's the wonderful privilege of prayer we have a mediator between us and god and that is jesus and he knows us and he won't ever belittle us he'll keep us where we need to be and he says be on alert because when you start praying the devil's not going to be happy but he says but you got to remember to pray. Don't stop. Be watchful when you pray. But then listen to what he says. With thanksgiving. Anybody got a reason to praise God tonight? Anybody? I mean, I've got a, a multitude of reasons right now to praise the Lord. I mean, I woke up this morning renewed in mercy before the throne of grace. That's a reason to praise God. And if you can find a reason to praise God, that's a reason to give him thanks. You can thank God for the same reason that you praise God. Why? Because the Bible teaches us to be thankful in all things. And so if you can thank him for what you praise him for, what are you praising him for? How many of you here have experienced the new birth, being born again in Christ? That's a reason to praise God. Salvation has come. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. And one day he's going to allow us to rise up with him. That's a reason to praise him, but it's something to be thankful for. Why? Because I'm thankful that this world is not all that's left for me. There's a place called heaven. I've got a reason to praise him for the mercy. Oh my goodness, how good he has been. Not to give me what I rightfully deserve. And Paul says in that, you've got a privilege. Don't ever forget the privilege, no matter what's going on, that you have to access that throne of grace and mercy and life. Be on alert because the devil's not happy. But give him thanks in all things. Oh, Paul talks a little bit about the privilege that we have in prayer. But then he goes into what we would call the partners that we have in praying. What do you mean by that? Look at what he says in verse 3. With all praying also for us. He says not only do you intercede 
uh, before the throne of grace for God to do great and wonderful things in your life and to see him move and to answer the prayers that you're asking for him. But he said, here's the uniqueness of the family of God. We're not alone. That's why we share prayer requests on a Wednesday night. That's why we share prayer in our Sunday school, in our small groups, in our deacons meetings, in our staff meetings. We share prayer requests. Why? Because we have an obligation not only to go before the throne of grace to ask God to do in and through us what he is wanting to do, but we can intercede on the behalf of others. And Paul says, if there's anything, don't forget that privilege of prayer, but understand that you're a partner in it as well. And here's something that's kind of amazing. Do you notice Paul did not ask to be put on the prayer list to be removed from prison? Did y'all see that? Look at it. He says, Praying for us also that God would open unto us a door. Now, I would think, well, it'd be that prison door right there that's holding me down. It would be these chains that were shackling me to get me out of my circumstance. But Paul said, no, I, I'm not asking for God to deliver me in that sense. He said, I'm asking that God would give me the opportunity to speak. That's why he says the door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also in bonds. He says, the reason I am here is because God gave me the opportunity to speak of his goodness and his grace and his love and his mercy to where I offered people salvation and they rejected it. And because they rejected the good news, the gospel, they rejected Jesus and now they reject me. And he said, they have put me in prison. But don't open the doors. Pray that God will give me an opportunity, even in the prison, to speak of the goodness of God. Why is that? He said, I'm talking about the gospel. Could you imagine him being chained between those guards? If anybody had a right to murmur and complain, I think it would be Paul. God all I ever did was preach the gospel and now I'm in chains, I'm down here in all this sewage and with the rats and don't have anything to eat and nobody. Did he complain? No. He said, I'm praying that you would, God, give me the opportunity to continue to speak. And Paul was looking for the opportunities, every chance he got to share the gospel. I can just see him as they were there and, and the times he would be strapped with the praetorian guard and be latched to them. I can just imagine and say, hey, hey, soldier, um got a question for you have you ever experienced the life-changing experience of grace through Jesus Christ and the salvation he offers and could you imagine them hearing that and then him looking over and this one saying no I don't want to hear any of that hush and hitting him over the head with a with a baton or something and then him turning over and say hey he didn't want to listen to me but will you listen to me I want to offer you the greatest gift that was ever given in his name is Jesus. And all you have to do is trust him and believe in him and he'll save you. Shut up, Paul, and hitting him over the head. And then having to listen to that over and over and over because usually they'd be on an eight-hour shift with him. And I can just see Paul there being chained to him. And after those guards released, uh, him looking up and saying, Oh, it's shift change. I got two more opportunities to witness to two more guards. That's how he looked at life. That's how he looked at his circumstances. He was looking for those opportunities to speak the gospel. And listen to what he says. He says, I want you to pray to give, that God will give me those opportunities, but then God would give me wisdom. Why? Wisdom to walk toward them that are without. He says that I might, may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Every opportunity, God, let me speak. But let me walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming that time. What does that mean? Those who don't know Christ, God, let me accept the challenge. Let me capitalize on that time that I have with them because time is so short. I don't know if they're going to leave out and go get killed in battle. I don't know if that will be the last time I ever see them. It may be that God takes me instead. So God, give me that chance, every opportunity to share the gospel. What is he talking about? Those that are out, it's those that are without Christ. I went back and was reading some different stories of Muhammad, Muhammad Gandhi and all of his travels and things that he did. 
And do you know Gandhi, when he came to America, he didn't come on a diplomatic journey, although he did see politicians and stuff. Do you know why he came to America? Gandhi came to America to study Christians. Because he said, I've heard about this Christianity, and I want to know more about this Christianity. And he started studying about Jesus. And he studied for quite an expanded time frame and was here. And in all of his studies and all the things that he did is he would talk to people who profess Christianity and all those that were in prominent positions in Christianity. He, he came out and he said this. As he was leaving America, he said, I would become a Christian had it not been for the way Christians treat their God. I would have converted to Christianity. But he says, but I haven't seen anyone that I've talked with and been a part of that treated their God as the one true God who is worthy of worship and all praise. And when I heard that, I was thinking, Lord, why would he say that? Because here's the reality. You can know everything there is to know about Jesus. You can be in a relationship with him. But if you don't have the wisdom to apply his word to those that are outside, you will drive them away instead of drawing them in. Why? You've got to understand they have no concept of anything but sin. And the first thing that they're going to look at is, well, what makes you better than me? And if they don't see Christ in you and the difference that he's made in you, how are we ever going to convince them? I've always been told the greatest salesman believes in the product that they're selling. Well, here's the thing. Our product is free. And we've got to do our best to give it away. Because why? That's how it was given to us, freely. And that flies into the philosophy of men. Why? Because we think we have to do things to earn things. But yet, Gandhi, when he looked at the Christians, he said, I don't see in them the value of their God. Is he really real to them? And so Paul says, I need partners in prayer. I need people that no matter the circumstances that they're in, they're going to be praying for me and I'm going to be praying for them. We're in this together. And we need all the wisdom because those that are without, Christ, give us the time to see them come to Jesus. How long do you think we have? If you'd have listened to a lot of the secular world, they would have thought that Monday would have been the day we were all going to go. But here's the reality. We're still here. How many more eclipses will we see? How many more sunsets will we see? How many more sunrises will we see until we see the sun rise eternal in Christ? Oh, Paul says, pray to redeem the time. We need partners in ministry. We need to understand our privilege of prayer. But then he says, then we have to do this. We have to prioritize the time. That redeeming the time literally means you make a purchase with. That means you make the most of the time that God has given you. Why? Because time is really a gift. And it's not how much time you have to live, but how you live in the time you have. I never understood, and still to this day will understand, why Rika went to be with the Lord before me. If y'all don't know that, that's, that's Anna Marie. That's my niece. But in the time that she has been in the presence of the Lord, do you know we are finding out even more of how she influenced people in her life? Not because of who she was and what she did and where she lived and where she went to, but by who she served. She loved Jesus. Was she perfect? No. Her and her brother would fight like cats and dogs. I'm telling you. I mean, it's just unreal. But one thing she did when she was around her peers, she expressed her love for Jesus. 
And I think that maybe she lived more for Jesus in the short time that she had on this world than many Christians ever will. Why? It's always been a, a thought in my mind, if, if you read an obituary of Brother Jeremy, either number one, I got out of God's will, or number two, he was done with me. And so here's the reality. All of us are still here. But the question is, how will we redeem the time? How, what will we invest into? What will we make the most of? How will we influence? How will we carry on? And he says, you do that by walking in that wisdom and toward them that are without. And he says, prioritize that in your life. Because I promise you this, you're influencing someone. Never knew how much an influence it could be to have the pre-K come in and do chapel with them. Until you see them out and you hear them in the conversations that they have with parents, they have with grandparents, and parents and grandparents come up and say, I am amazed at what they are learning. Not their ABCs, not all the things, that their colors and shapes, but how they're learning about Jesus. And, and that's not because of Brother Jeremy, it's because of the faithfulness of God's Word. Even our teachers teaching them in the classroom. They're like little sponges. They're just soaking it up. And I wonder what day God's going to wring them out to where somebody would just get a blessing of grace in their life. Prioritize the time. But then remember this, practice grace. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. What does it mean to practice grace? It, it means you should be uplifting toward people. Now, I'm going to promise you this is hard because there's some people that you're just not going to G haul with. Uh, it's, it's hard. Why? Because grace is extending towards someone something that they don't even deserve. But what does it mean? Grace should be uplifting. It should be building up. It, it should be something that lifts people's countenance when you come into their presence. Why? Because that's what grace did for us. It lifted us from death to life. It, and Paul says, when you experience that grace and you practice that grace, you will lift people up out of the circumstance that they're in to where they'll see Jesus. It builds them up. It doesn't tear them down. It builds them. Why? Because that's what grace does. It fortifies, it strengthens, it encourages, it, it builds up someone. And he says that's how you're supposed to practice toward people. And it edifies them. It, it gives them what they need. And the greatest need a person has is grace. And he says let that speech be what comes out of you. Why? Because he says it should be as seasoned with salt. Now if You've ever, have you ever ate anything that was just bland? I mean, you bite into it and you're just like, there's no flavoring to it. And what do you do? You reach across there and you grab that white salt shaker and you just, nothing worse than just bland green beans. I mean, y'all ever ate just green beans that had no flavor to it? I'm talking about no, no salting pork, no fat back, no lard or anything put in them. Now, some of you are getting hungry because you're thinking, man, that would be some good green beans right now. I mean, have you ever ate a green bean that had no taste? I mean, it's just like, that, what am I chewing on? What do you do? You grab the salt and pour it. I, I grab Tony's and just shake it on. I like spices. He says, that's what you should do. Salt brings something that is flavorful. Now, if y'all put salt on watermelon, I'm just heaven help you. Some of you do. I like my watermelon sweet. But what does he say? He says it's something that is flavorful. Salt also preserves. Back in the day when you didn't have refrigerators, what did they do? They'd rub meats down with salt. Why? It would preserve it. Nothing like a good aged steak, is there? If you wanted to see the one I saw down in Guatemala, it had been hanging out there in the middle of the streets of Guatemala for about two weeks, and it had hairs on it, it had flies around it, and they still cut it off and served it to people. I don't want mine aged like that, though. But what does salt do? It preserves. 
And he says, and when you do that, he says, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Which means what? Our words are going to carry weight. How, how many of you have been watching sports lately? I mean, did you watch the Final Four? Alabama made it to number three final AP ranking. It was amazing. It was a miracle, I guess. I don't know. They just put it all together. I watched Purdue and UConn battling it out. Watched the coach and the guy from the giant from Purdue almost get in a fight. And I'm thinking, why is the coach out there talking to him? Doesn't he know all he got to do is just step on him and squish him like jelly? But have you ever noticed that in today's society, we have phenomenal video cameras? As a matter of fact, you can take these little cameras that we have mounted here on the walls. It was kind of amazing. Me and Brother David's doing something for the youth on the youth rally. And you'll have to be here to see what it is. But I'm going to tell you, I could take that camera right back there. I can turn my Bible like this and zoom in on it on that back there up in the booth. And you could read the Bible. I mean, you could even write, read the footnotes that are below it. Now, some of you have to have bifocals just to see it when it's that close. But those things are amazing. They pick up everything. I mean, there might be times, there might be things hanging out of my nose that are on the video feed, and I want to go up there and edit it and scribble it out. But you know, when, they fir when we first put those in here, we zoomed in, and there was a small little baby roach, not like one of the big ones that went down the side and half the church about got Pentecostal on me the other, that one Sunday. But, I mean, we could zoom in and see it all. I was like, what's that down there on the floor? And we zoomed in and just got right down there. And I was like, that's a bug. I was like, that is amazing. And so when I've been watching these sports, I, I, I've been amazed at how many times it pans over to those athletes. And, and, and many times when they do something good, it's not always good that comes out of that little thing right here, is it? I mean, I would love to think that when it zoomed in on some of Nick Saban's rant, rants and things, that he was saying, Jesus loves you and grace be with you. <laughs> you know good and well that's not what he was saying. <laughs> Why? Because it zoomed in and it was under just deep scrutiny. And, and when I look at it, I'm thinking like, ooh, I know what they just said. And they, didn't, they weren't thanking God for scoring that basket. He didn't tell the coach, I appreciate your comments, and we'll talk after the game. Mm-mm. And I was thinking, they need a good dose of Jesus. And then the Lord just hit me and said, how many times is a lost person watching us? And saying, if that's the dose of Jesus, I don't want it. Mm-mm. I know, I'm the world's worst because I, now that they've, they've let me keep the books in softball, I've found out that this thing can operate a little bit and not get thrown out of the game because I'm on the other side of the fence. And I got tickled because some of our church members even heard me say when our umpire called a strike that was all the way in the other batter's box and rung up my daughter, I said, don't worry, baby, he's wider than the Mississippi and it's flooded right now. And they started laughing. He's like, preacher, we ain't never heard you say anything like that. And it, and it just reminded me, people are watching us. People are listening. And, and we got to be wise in our approach. And it's not so much how you're acting and, and the way that you're doing things, but it's more in the reaction that they can get from you as they throw those flaming darts at you. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes those darts can come from a spouse. Sometimes it can come from kids. Sometimes it can come from all circumstances and situations. And the whole world is zooming in on you. How are they going to act? How are they going to react? And usually it only takes one time to be wrong. And they'll never forget it. And so Paul says, in all things, act gracious. 
Which means what? Sometimes it's good that God caged that little fleshly member behind all that enamel in the flesh to lock it down. And sometimes you got to use that enamel to bite it down. Why? That little member can do a lot of damage in a little bit of time. And I wonder who's watching. So don't forget your privilege that you have in prayer. You can go to God anytime. Keep going to him. And when he answers or he doesn't answer or he even tells you no, thank him because his way is always best. Know that you're not alone. That's why we can share with one another. We can just give out those requests and we can say, hey, look, here it is. We need those opportunities for what? To walk in that wisdom for that those that are outside, we might be able to approach them. And if there's ever a time we need to be praying for the lost, it's now. Time's short. How short? I don't know, but it's very short compared to eternity. And there's a lot of people not ready to face eternity. And while we're doing it, do it in grace. Why? Because that's what it's always about. No matter what our circumstances is, thank God for grace. Can I pray for us tonight? Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, let us redeem the time that you have given us even now. And Lord, if someone wants to come and access that privilege of prayer tonight, then Lord, let them come. If there's a concern on a person's heart, let them know they're not alone. They've got partners that will join with them. Let them grab someone and come and just pray. Lord, let us redeem this time for your glory. Because God, those that are out without Christ, the only hope they have is that we will share with them. And that by your spirit, you bring conviction and draw them to salvation. And so, God, we need grace in how to approach them, how to deal with them, how to talk with them. So, God, whatever needs to be done tonight, this is your invitation. Lord, use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. If anyone needs to come, the altar's open.
Amen. And God is good. He knows my name. And we know he is the name of Jesus. All hearts clear, minds clear. You ready to meet him? Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we just thank you that, Lord, in that privilege that comes, there is a great responsibility. And, God, that is to be bearers of your grace and your gospel. And so, Lord, as we go out, give us that wisdom that we need from on high. And, Lord, give us that that boldness, as you promised that we would have, to be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. So, Lord, as we go out, let us go out worshiping you and praising you for how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen.